And I think we're getting a lot closer to that than most people think. And I think it's going to be a lot bigger than most people think. So let's take a look at uh, Morgan Stanley's forecast. And the, the Jonas, Adam Jonas said that our Tesla forecasts through 2030 do not include any production of CyberCab. That's why they they have a $310 price target. That's their base case. So here's the $310 base case. You can see that blue is Tesla Auto. Yellow is Tesla Energy. I like that their energy is so close to um, auto. That's great. Tesla mobility and ride sharing, small bit, but this is 2030. So I think we think it's going to be much higher by then. And then you've got the Tesla network services, and then you've got EV powertrain third party. That's their base case of $310. So small for all that. Can you imagine? You're doing autonomy. You're doing powertrain third party. Uh, you're doing a ton of energy. You're doing this Tesla network. And yeah, it's still $310. I, 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 what? And then their bull case here is $500. Ah, uh, okay. Adam is a strange cat, I mm. just have to say. He, <laughs> like, he wants to think pie in the sky, and then he's in this, like, ultra conservative financial price target straight jacket that is like, <laughs> hey, they're going to do these things that are going to revolutionize the world, and it's only going to be worth $2. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, that's just the what his notes feel like almost every time. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Like, it, it just makes you kind of discount the the financial side of his notes, like the value of the financial side of his notes to almost zero. Like, that's... You know, well, either they succeed I, and it's massive or they don't succeed and it's overvalued. Like this weird yeah. in-between place where, yeah, I, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. No, I think I think I wouldn't say that. I'd say that his research is what's really good. They do deep yeah. dive research. It's fantastic. But of course, they're, what did you just straight jacket is like the right word, right? The, the, the price target is a totally separate, you know, they have to like keep it really, you know. Yeah, it's basically because how do we. It's how they're measured. It's how they're going to the get paid. the backwards math. That's yeah. how their customers will look at. But the research is really the true story. Here's the next guy, Jim Cramer, and he has no research. So just don't believe anything he says. But boy, it's scary because he's now he's not very he's now bullish on Tesla. So let's watch what he's saying here. Some stories are just too good to be true. And that's how I feel about the possibility of a federal proclamation that leads to a nationwide rollout of fully self-driving cars. Tesla's stock was up again today because we're getting reports that President-elect Trump, who is an avowed climate change denier, has cast his lot with Elon Musk to develop national self-driving vehicles. It's pretty clear that Trump doesn't see the need for electrics. In fact, he wants to end any subsidies, including tax credits for manufacturing them. However, he did state, I'm going to quote here, I'm for electric cars. I have to be because, you know, Elon endorsed me very strongly, end quote. A little transactional for me. Look, I'm not I'm not against owning Tesla. You know that. I just think that this is a bad reason. Elon Musk tells a very compelling story about full self-driving as well as solar robots, all wrapped up into one stock of a company that happens to make vehicles. Ah. Bye, 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 bye. But the idea that, that the White House can somehow allow self-driving cars everywhere with the stroke of a pen, that's just plain fanciful. First, our country simply doesn't work like that. We have state and local governments with tremendous power to block it, anything. I remember when I was going to be able to take a self-driving taxi from downtown Phoenix to Glendale, the home of the Arizona Cardinals, a couple years ago for the Super Bowl. It seemed so simple, except Glendale didn't allow self-driving vehicles. I was incredulous, but the municipal government of Glendale was able to block us. Second, you might think it's natural for Trump to just declare the federal interstate highway system its self-driving zone. But you know what? That's meaningless, too. Think about it. How do you get on the interstate highway system other than a few municipalities that may be designated on some map someday? It's catch as catch can. The feds can't control state or local self-driving laws. If they try it, those municipalities will sue the Federal Highway Administration, and they're going to win. There was another time in this country when a president might have been able to do something about this. In the 1950s, President Eisenhower planned and executed the interstate highway system. But he did that for national defense reasons. In those days, we had a Cold War with the Soviet Union as an overarching imperative in our nation, which made the Interstate Highway Act a much easier sell. 
Still, I like the concept that, that there's what Barclays calls an Elon premium. To me, Tesla deserves the premium. Musk has no doubt influenced the president-elect to scrap the $7,500 clean vehicle credit, which will make it much harder for legacy automakers to ever compete with Tesla. We're going to hear from Ford and GM CFO at a conference on Wednesday, and we'll learn how their electric divisions can handle the end of those tax credits. I believe GM can handle it, but Ford, well, they may be stuck in neutral waiting for the warranty issues to dissipate if they ever can. Yeah, pause them there. What do you think about everything he just said? Yeah, I, you know, when you listen to him, he sounds a lot less bullish than, you know, it's, there's a lot of skepticism that he's saying there. And I would say that that's good because I definitely don't want Jim Cramer to be too excited about Tesla. That That is uh, a little bit concerning. I think he underestimates, though, if we have basically public support really turned towards the adoption of autonomous vehicles that's really important and you know politically that will be the thing that matters that you know if you're if you've got a city or a you know at the state level whatever level it is that you want to look at and the majority of the constituents in that area want that legislation to be passed and i think it is going to be passed and so i hear the argument that he's making that you know Mm -hmm. the american regulatory system is hard to navigate that there's you know you you can't just issue some proclamation from on high and expect it to be adopted everywhere. Uh, But I think if we win the safety argument conclusively with data, that all of those objections that he had to the ability of autonomous vehicles to be rolled out nationally basically just go away. Um, Now, will it take a little bit of time? Sure. But the federal government taking some sort of a leadership role in creating a framework that is easy to adopt Like that's not necessarily issuing a proclamation from on high on exactly how everyone has to do this, but it is basically giving political cover uh, to people who then like they have some constituency that says, hey, yeah, we want this uh, to be able to move forward more quickly. So I think it does accelerate the adoption if we have something like that at the federal level. Um, So I would disagree with him there. Uh, Agree that the... Elon Musk premium is important. Like he can do things that other people just can't do. Uh, But in all of it, he didn't really identify the most exciting and important piece of the Tesla story in general, which is still the humanoid robotics uh, move. And I think we're getting a lot closer to that than most people think. And I think it's going to be a lot bigger than most people think. So the fact that he's missing out on that makes me feel a lot better. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, good. So thank you for that. Let's watch the next video here. Tom Narayan of RBC says self-driving justifies Tesla's market cap more than car sales. Let's uh, listen to what he's saying here. It said that the Trump administration is planning to ease federal rules on self-driving be- driving vehicles. Now, this follows news on Friday that Trump's team is also reportedly planning to kill the $7,500 tax credit for EV purchases. So joining us now is Tom Narayan of RBC Capital Markets. Tom, it's great to have you on. Let's start right there. What's going to matter more for Tesla and for the vehicle market and any of these AI plays that might be attached to autonomous driving? Is it going to be uh, a different regulatory landscape for autonomous vehicles or is it going to be taking away uh, that that tax credit? What's going to matter more? It's going to be giving uh, less regulatory restrictions on robo taxis, definitely. Uh, Federal restrictions was one of the big reasons why GM uh, stop making its origin uh, purpose-built vehicle, right? That allows you to make a vehicle without pedals and steering wheels. So you need that federal deregulation, if you were to call it a policy framework in order to allow for that. And that's what the Tesla cyber cab is. Why is that important? It cuts down a lot of costs, right? You know, currently the competition is, you know, Waymo, you guys talked about that. Uh, it has pedals, steering wheels. It's another car, uh, it's another car company making the vehicle. Right. So if you can make your own vehicle at lower cost, doesn't have steering wheels or pedals, you can bring down the cost. And Tesla's argument is they can actually gobble up market share. And if you look at autonomy and AI, et cetera, that comes at a much higher multiple. You have a trillion plus dollar market cap for Tesla. You know, is are you going to get there with an auto business for selling more cars or through AI autonomy? Right. So autonomy is the way they can justify that market cap more they can from selling cars. Mm. Uh, so, so it raises the question. Tesla bounced again today up more than 5%. It was one of the best performers in the market. 
Uh, it's up more than 50 percent in a month. We have seen shares also today, to your point about Waymo, of Uber under pressure. It doesn't seem like this is a zero-sum game. Anybody who's tied to these regulations or exposed to these regulations, I would imagine, is going to benefit. But looking at Tesla specifically, are you surprised to see how much the stock has run in just a short period of time? Uh, yes and no. I think post-election, I was somewhat surprised, uh, especially with the move uh, on the $7,500 credit being uh, cut. I. I actually think that's a negative for Tesla. I know there's a narrative that uh, eliminating that credit is good for Tesla because it can compete better against other EVs. But the reality is in the U.S., penetration for EVs is only 8%. Tesla's real competition is Toyota Camry, right? Not the Chevy Equinox. So I actually think that credit going away is actually a negative for Tesla. But the reality is getting federal deregulation on AI or specifically on, on uh, self-driving vehicles is a huge positive, assuming it all happens, right? Remember, this is all like in the, you know, we don't know the details here, devil's in the details. Um, but just because, you know, my Robotax evaluation is 44% of my whole price target. Mm. FSD is 33%, right? So like the, the sky, not the sky's the limit, but, but you get the idea, right? Like we're talking about huge multiples. And so, so that deregulation, I'm not surprised. So Tom, uh, the stock has moved about 90 bucks a share, uh, I think, since the election. How much is Tesla now a Musk and Trump stock? It was a Musk stock before, and that had its benefits. And, and right now, um, Elon Musk and the president-elect seem very much aligned, and it's moving on some of this policy stuff. But how much risk is there for investors? How much should investors keep in mind the possibility that at some point these two guys— who have been known to be a little erratic, disagree on something, and uh, what kind of an impact could that have on the stock? Yeah, and I've written that I thought that the move after the election, a lot of that move wasn't really based on fundamentals, right? It was based on a maybe this could happen type uh, ideology. But I do have to say, though, that something like deregulating, you know, robotaxis, autonomy on a federal basis, it does matter. Um, and that's also something that once a genie's out of the bottle, it's hard to kind of put that back, right? So it, it's a mixed answer to your question. I do think certainly, like, it's it's not completely tied to a president-elect, but certainly having policy that's a tailwind for you most definitely helps, right? So it's kind of a mixed answer, but I do think, like, if you believe in robotaxis, you do believe in autonomy, FSD, if you believe in it, um, having deregulation kind of sets everything in motion to achieve what this company wants to achieve. Okay, so that video was, uh, in his interview was on Monday. We're doing this interview on Tuesday. It's probably going to publish tomorrow. So you saw that his price target is 313. <laughs> he talks He talks the big game. He says, oh my God, this is going to be big. 44% of my price target is, you know, I believe in autonomy. This is going to open it up. 313. So it's just another example. Apart from that, though, I really do think a lot of his commentary is excellent. Um, I think one thing or maybe two things that I would add, one of them is that he didn't mention the discount that I think Tesla had on it just because Elon was in the crosshairs of the fourth branch of government, the administrative state. And, you know, I think that overhang is lifted. Um, so we mentioned that early in the earlier in the episode. And I'll just say that that's one thing that he didn't mention at all in his interview that I think is an additional factor. Um, and then the other thing on his Trump, Elon Musk commentary is that Elon and Trump both need each other, I think a lot. And I don't expect them to get along just incredibly well for the next four years. I do think that we're going to see some of the big ego headbutting um, that you would expect between two figures like Elon and Donald Trump. But I think that they will end up being able to work through most of that at a pretty good level. And that overall, the relationship is going to be overwhelmingly bene mutually beneficial for both Donald Trump and for Elon Musk over the next four years. And so I while I think that, yeah, we're going to get some, uh, you know, there's going to be some noise. There's going to be reporting around things. Um, there could be some arguments. I don't think it's going to 
devolve into some sort of a thing where then Elon is back on the hit list for, you know, a whole bunch of federal agencies again. And, um, you know, if you can mm-hmm. take that off the table, well, then, you know, it certainly couldn't be any worse than it is right now. Like it's still a positive direction. Um, and then, like I said, I think that uh, in an environment of Cold War 2.0, I think Elon is an incredibly important figure that, uh, and and I think that Donald Trump knows that. And then I also think in reverse that Elon knows that Donald Trump is an incredibly important person uh, at this point in Cold War 2.0 to kind of shift the tides because we've been going in a very negative direction in that competition for a long time. And we've got to start moving with some decisiveness and some pep in our step, because uh, if we don't, we're really going to be in a very terrible position, you know, five, 10 years from now.